<clears throat> hey Mateo, um, making this video here today, uh, your request on a further explanation on, on ROIC and also my thoughts on CROIC. Um, so I'm going to start off here with value investing journey, value investing journey, float analysis, valuation, and profitability metric template. You should have this. If you don't, let me know. Okay, so ROIC, what we're trying to do with return on invested capital is trying to, we're trying to get an idea of how profitable the company is when carrying its, or when comparing its operating margin to essentially its balance sheet. That's what all of these come from, shower rolls equity, uh, debt and debt equivalents, cash, cash equivalents, and other investments. This is essentially what we're doing here. So let's go one by one. Operating earnings or operating income. This is operating margin, operating income, EBIT. Uh, this, we use this profitability metric because we want to think as entire owners uh, or owners of the entire business, either potential or that we already own the business. So we want to know what the company earns from operation. That's why we use EBIT instead of EBITDA or net income. Okay, so we divide this by the sum of these numbers, shareholders' equity, which is essentially um, assets minus liabilities and whatever's left over. Hopefully, or usually, it should be positive. Um, if it's not, that's a gigantic red flag. Debt debit equivalents. This is, in this calculation right here, just to keep things simple, I use short-term and long-term debt for this example we're doing here right now. I also include um, operating leases, um, underfunded pensions, those numbers from the that you calculate with the TV calculation as well um, that are considered debt and debt equivalents like the um, long-term obligations, um, those kind of things I throw in here as well. But for this calculation, just to keep things simple, we're going to just use short-term and long-term debt. Cash and cash equivalents, just cash on hand and other investments. This is typically investments in other companies. Um, other assets, uh, whatever the case may be. In my arena, typically with what I focus on being smaller companies, you don't necessarily see this a whole lot, um, but you pretty much 100% of the time will see these. So, Okay, and I, I talk about this here. If a company has operating leases on open pensions, I include this in the debt equivalence part of the calculation. Uh, let's see, what else do I explain down here? Okay, yeah, I don't subtract goodwill generally because it's more conservative number when you can include goodwill. Um, okay, and this is important. I don't know how Morningstar calculates ROIC, so I don't rely on their metrics at all, which I'll show you in a second, um, what their ROIC is um, for this company we're going to look at. I always do my own calculations because not only it will take a little bit longer, but it allows you to know what goes into the number because there are multiple different ways to calculate ROIC, um, which may lead you, you to a question, why do I calculate ROIC the way I calculate it? Because frankly, this is the simplest way to do it and the way that makes most sense to me. Um, we want I want to keep things as simple as possible in pretty much every aspect, and I want to make sure it makes sense to me on a kind of logical basis, um, which we're essentially, again, here, EBIT, right here, divided by the balance sheet. So we're essentially just seeing how well or how much profitability the company produces from its balance sheet strength or balance sheet um, ability. Um, and that makes perfect sense to me as a total business owner. I want to know this kind of number. So, um, and this is almost 100% of the time true. The way I calculate ROIC, I don't know what it is, but it's almost always higher than the morning star number. Um, I don't know if they take out goodwill in their in their calculation or what. But again, I want a conservative. I want the most conservative number as possible. Um, because that's what we do as value investors. We want the most conservative numbers as possible, so we make sure there's a margin. So, having said that, let's get to 
the calculation for this company. I'm calculating it on this company. I'm very familiar with this company. I've done, um, I've owned this company. This is the longest tenure company I've owned. I think it's, I've owned it for five or six years now. Um, one of the first companies I actually did real world research on. I still own it to this day as of this recording. Um, and I mean, it has a pretty simple business model as well. So easy to understand. So Morningstar's ROIC for the company is 3.6%. And I'm just notating everything here. So we are cognizant of what is what. Um, again, I take notes on everything pretty much. Um, so I don't have to guess when it comes back to looking at these later. Um, that's pretty much straightforward. So, okay, let's go down to thousands. And again, if you're using Morningstar, it's weird. You have the trailing 12 month numbers back up here now, which is fantastic. So I don't have to calculate it. So operating income again, EBIT 6.6, 6, round it up. Six divided by okay. Show of his equity. Which is this number right here, one oh four. Actually it's this is on thousands and on millions, so let's go to thousands to get a more accurate number. So 103 point, let's say 104, round it up. 104. Oops. Plus debt and debt equivalents. Plus 14.2, so what is that? 54. Point Four rounded up, so four point four. Four. Minus cash. Two point big drop in cash here. Um that's interesting to me. This is a cyclical business, but not that cyclical, so that is not a great sign. So, I'm really going to go through and have a little bit of an exercise with you, and we'll get back to that. We're going to calculate ROIC with last quarter's cash and cash equivalents, and this quarter to show the kind of difference that these kind of numbers can make over a quarter to quarter or whatever. Um, so, investments, no other investments. So, oh, got to add the cash. Take out the cash, sorry. 2.6. 6. Oops. 6. 0. Okay. So six point six six divided by one point five point eight equals four point two percent rounded up. 
Okay. So, I look for anything over 10 on a consistent basis. Why? Because, frankly, that's the number I found that works. Um, that's it. When it's over 5 on a consistent basis, that means it's a good, what I consider a good degree of business. Because, essentially, think of it this way. For every $1 in EBIT this company produces, or that, yes, that this company produces in any given trailing 12 month period, it gets back 10% of that. So, obviously, the higher this number is, the better. Now, let me illustrate something. 6.6 .6 divided by 4 plus 4.4. Sorry, I'm having trouble typing today. Minus. Okay, so let's go back to last quarter just for kind of learning purposes. 26.8. 26.8. Zero, zero, four, four, so one thirty one point six, one thirty one point six, and this equals. So five five percent, so slightly higher, um, but that I would just wanted to illustrate that point to you that you need to be cognizant of when something like this happens. When you see something like this, there's a massive drop. You need to figure out what's going on here, and if this is going to be the new norm. I can see they have a lot more accounts receivable, a lot more inventories, uh, which could mean. They're having some issues selling some of their products or they're ramping up for a big production period, big production order, that kind of thing. Also notice a big jump here in Goodwill. I know that's related to a recent acquisition, so I'm assuming that's what this is related to as well. I haven't evaluated this company since they've done the acquisition, uh, but, 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 which is why all these numbers are higher, 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 higher because of the acquisition. So, quite a bit higher, a lot higher, and that's where the debt, gigantic amount of debt comes in. So, so that I'm glad I saw that. So, let's go back to last quarter. Let's go back fully to last quarter before their acquisition and recalculate their ROIC again before they got all this debt. They brought all this debt on. So, I'm glad I noticed that. So, let's leave those there. Let's go back and actually, so let's get these four months, of trailing 12 months, because this is the first quarter with, right here with the new information. So this, this process I'm going through right now is the legitimate process I go through when there, a company does something like acquires a business or subsidiary, um, which I'm glad I picked this company um, because this is a great exercise. So their last, their trailing 12 months EBIT in this period before the acquisition is eight. Balance sheet, so stockholders' equity, so 101.9 plus, and the big difference here will be coming the higher cash and the lower debt. So, three, so 6.7, 6.8 million. 6 .8. See the gigantic difference here, obviously. Debt from the acquisition, debt before acquisition. Minus, what was the cash? 26.8. Again, illustrating cash after acquisition, 
cast before acquisition. Okay. now is just exactly my 10% threshold. 9.8%. So, before the acquisition, this was their ROIC, 9.8%. They had a healthier balance sheet with less debt, more cash, producing higher EBIT, after the acquisition, which one quarter doesn't really do much, you can't really tell much from one quarter, so I'm going to give this about a year to figure out and see what their kind of strategy is going forward, how they're incorporating the acquisition, those kind of things, and I'll reevaluate. But as of right now, their balance sheet strength is far worse. They have more, a lot more debt, and they have a lot more cash on, or a lot less cash on hand, and they're producing less EBIT as well, which affects which is why these margins have dropped quite significantly, which affects this right here, free cash flow production, which affects this right here, cash and cash as a percentage of balance sheet, short-term debt as a percentage of the balance sheet, long-term debt as a percentage of the balance sheet, which likely Excuse me, before I go on, which part of the reason is higher accounts receivable and inventory, and those two lead to a higher cash conversion cycle. So all this is interconnected. Everything I teach is interconnected in some way. There's deeper layers to pretty much everything, but they are all interconnected. They can all tell you multiple different facets of a company, its balance sheet strength, its profitability, its free cash flow production, cash conversion cycle, if it's a healthy um, operating business, um, all these things are interconnected. And I can tell that just from this one ROIC calculation, what was going on with their balance sheet strength, their cash levels, their profitability, which led me to look at their inventory levels when I was looking at their balance sheet and their accounts receivable, which led me to this. So this is like a, a little, and I tell this to every one of my students, this is legitimately like a treasure hunt. You find one clue, and you find another clue, which departs, which takes you to the next clue, which takes you to the next clue, which takes you to the next clue, and then it, you continue to build your investment thesis from that kind of going forward, uh, which you'll talk about in later sessions. Um, but for now, oh, almost forgot to talk about CROIC. So the reason I don't talk about CROIC is because, frankly, I don't use it. Why? Because to me, it it's pretty much the same exact metric as the operating, um, using the operating or the regular RIC, which is where we use operating earnings. Instead of this, you just use free cash flow. Um, it's pretty much the exact same thing, unless the ca free cash flow production is a lot different than operating margin production, which does happen on occasion. This would come into play, but pretty much to me, this is just a redundant um profitability metric, which is why I focus on ROIC, ROCE, and unleavened return on net tangible equity because they're all slightly different um, in what they measure. This one just uses a different metric. Um, and typically, most of the time, operating margin and or operating income and free cash flow are reasonably close. There are occasions where they would be a lot different, um, but in most cases, they're within probably, I would say, 10 to 20% of each other. So this number wouldn't calculating this number would just be redundant um, and that's why I don't use it so uh, thanks for the great question I'm gonna add this to the master class um, along with Shafiq's video and if you guys have any more questions want any more um, special training videos like this before we get to our one-on-one um, -on -one training sessions 
and group training sessions, let me know and I'll make videos for you um, because I want you to learn as much as you possibly can, as fast as you possibly can. So if I can clear anything up for you, let me know. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you thought of it via email or in the um, exclusive Facebook group, the secret Facebook group for Masterclass members only. Uh, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Mateo. Bye.